a murderous British-American multi-millionaire on the run in touristic Mexico, a billionaire thief being dismembered and thrown to the sharks, a man so extremely violent you get five million bucks if you can help get him arrested. We've got it all for you today. Listen carefully because there's a minimum reward of $100,000 if you can provide information that leads to the arrest of any of these people. Arnoldo Jimenez May 12, 2012, Burbank, Illinois There's love in the air at Chicago City Hall. A now-married couple, 24-year-old Estrella Carrera and 30-year-old Arnaldo Jimenez have just looked into each other's eyes and sworn under God to love and cherish each other until they are parted by death, which happened a few hours later when Carrera was stabbed and dumped in a bathtub, still wearing her silver sequined cocktail dress, the same dress she'd worn for the ceremony. Spouses murdering spouses is nothing new. It's been going on since holy matrimony became a thing. But murder after just a few hours of marriage is incredibly rare. What kind of maniac would do such a thing? There were early signs that Jimenez might be capable of murder. He was said to be possessive of Carrera. At six feet tall and over 200 pounds, he towered over his lover. The two had a two-year-old son, and Carrera had an eight-year-old daughter from another relationship, a straight-A student at her school in Chicago's southwest side. According to one of Carrera's friends, the reason for the rushed and low-key wedding was that Jimenez had been threatening to take both kids from her. She was really scared and that was the last time I talked to her, the friend told the press. The two didn't want to invite many people at the ceremony, but they'd invited some of their friends out to a Mexican restaurant to celebrate, with a plan to go to a nightclub after that. What happened next? We don't know. We do know that the couple was last seen around 4 a.m. At some point, Jimenez called his sister and told her he had a bad fight with his wife. That fight led to him becoming the 522nd fugitive on the FBI's most wanted list since 1950. Carrera's body was found sometime later lying in the bathtub of her apartment, her pretty dress bloodied, and her body showing stab wounds. Soon, police were saying the suspect, Jimenez, was last seen driving a 2006 Maserati with Illinois license plate L641441. The background check showed he'd once been arrested for domestic violence, but in another state with another woman. Investigators aren't sure where he went after. It's expected he might have fled to Durango and Mexico, possibly to the area of Santiago Papasquiaro. Jimenez may also have gone to Reynosa, Tamaulipas in Mexico. We know that his phone was tracked to Chicago and then to Tennessee and later to Arkansas. It was last used in Hidalgo, Texas near the Mexican border, but that was back in 2012. Jimenez is charged with first-degree murder in Cook County with the added federal charges of unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. As with all these people you hear about today, if you can help, call 1-800-CALL-FBI or if outside the U.S., contact your nearest American consulate. This next crime is beyond brutal. Alexis Flores July 29, 2000 Five-year-old Ariana De Jesus is playing outside her house with her sister in Huntington Park neighborhood of North Philadelphia. It's hard to say what happened next, but the last time little Ariana was seen, she was walking down the street with a man. Her mother came rushing out of the house frantically asking where her daughter had gone and who this man was. For the next three days, police in the community searched high and low, and on the third day, the mother's worst nightmare became a reality. Ariana was found dead, her body stuffed into a trash bag under some rolls of carpet. She'd been strangled. Notably, a bloody t-shirt was lying nearby, unmistakable due to its unique political logo. A local resident came forward and said he knew that t-shirt. He'd lent it to a homeless guy named Carlos. In fact, he'd felt sorry for him, so he'd given him some clothes and some odd jobs to do. Carlos was, in fact, a man named Alexis. But for seven long years, the police had no idea what monster had committed this violent act of crime. Before we tell you more about this man, we should explain something. Terrible crimes happen all the time in the U.S. So why do some fugitives get on the FBI's most wanted list and others don't? There are criteria, although it's quite vague. First, the person might be a danger to society, but that's pretty obvious. Another main reason is the police think by putting someone on the list, publicity will be the best way to capture them. They stay on the list until they are arrested, the charges are dropped, or they are no longer meeting those criteria. As of January 2023, 529 fugitives have been added to the list, and an impressive 93% have been caught, with 31% being captured directly because the public assisted in some way. The FBI believes that by letting people see images of Alexis Flores, someone will get in touch with them. Maybe you've even met him. He was likely born in 1975 in Honduras, although he's lied a lot about his date of birth in the past. He's had various names, including Mario Flores, Mario Roberto Flores, Mario F. Roberto, Alex Contreras, and Alexis Contreras. He's about 5 feet 4, has a slight build, weighing 140 pounds, 
has black hair and brown eyes, and speaks Spanish as well as English. Now that could be a lot of people, but if you met this guy, you'd see something very unique. He has the word Alexis tattooed on his left hand, and the letters LA inked on his right hand. He also has quite a large scar on his neck and his cheek, the result of a surgery after an injury that happened to him during the 1998's Hurricane Mitch. What is such a pity about this case is the cops had him, not once, but twice, but at the time they didn't know he'd committed that murder. In 2000, just a short time after he killed the girl, he was arrested in Arizona for shoplifting. In 2002, he was arrested again. Cops had been called to his apartment after someone had complained about the noise, and when they looked at Flores' ID, they discovered it was a fake. Police reports say the man was friendly and calm, although they noted that upon searching his house, they discovered pornographic material lying around. They also said the man told them prior to living in Arizona, he'd lived in Illinois. Flores spent 60 days in jail for the forgery of a document, and as soon as he was released, he was sent back to Honduras. It was only later that the investigators linked his DNA with the murder of that young girl. He's now been charged with murder as well as the unlawful flights to avoid prosecution. You might be watching this in Honduras and think you've seen the man, but there's every chance Flores might have sneaked back into the US and is currently living under a new name. Our next criminal is a mastermind who ruined countless people's lives. Gruja Ignatova Right now, there are just 11 women on the FBI's most wanted list, which currently contains hundreds of names. And to no surprise, Ruja deserves to be there. In the financial world, you could call her a princess of darkness. She's also sometimes referred to as the Crypto Queen. That's because with her fake cryptocurrency, she ripped people off to the tune of $4 billion. This Bulgarian-born German national created one coin, which to investors looked like a cryptocurrency that was going places. In fact, it was kind of a pyramid scheme and a Ponzi scheme all at the same time. It wasn't even a real decentralized cryptocurrency, but a currency hosted on OneCoin's own servers. In terms of how it worked, investors got other investors to join in the scheme. That's the pyramid part. To keep the investors happy, OneCoin paid older investors with new investors money, which might be called robbing Peter to pay Paul or a Ponzi scheme. Ignatova and others behind the scam banked the money in offshore accounts as starry-eyed investors and young folks thinking they could get their money for free piled their cash into the scheme. In the UK alone, regular folks and larger investors lost about $120 million. For some people, we're talking about their life savings. In the US, investors gave her around $50 million. We know that Ignatova was born in 1980 to a middle-class Romani family in Bulgaria. After moving to Germany, she worked in legit businesses and earned herself a legit PhD. She also studied European law at Oxford University, although it seems there is some doubt about that. What is certain, though, is that she did have a reputation as a business professional. We imagine all the people that endorsed her on her LinkedIn page are now feeling pretty stupid, because in 2017, when she was tipped off that one coin was being investigated, she disappeared into thin air. That's some feat when your name is tied to numerous businesses and your face has been seen all over the world. She boarded a plane in Sofia, Bulgaria, landed in Greece, and has never been seen again, or at least the people who most want to see her haven't seen her. The FBI says she conned unsuspecting victims out of billions of dollars after claiming that her one coin would be the Bitcoin killer. Truth is, one coin was about as valuable as secondhand toilet paper. Investigation showed that when Inla Tova started the coin with some partners, she called the first investors idiots and crazy, stating that when they were found out for what they were doing, they should take the money and run and then blame somebody else. This is an incredibly smart woman, someone who was believed when she told her school friends that one day she'd be rich. At a young age, she was a skilled chess player, and in later life, she became fluent in Russian, German, and English. She was smart enough to go missing when many of her investors started asking for their money back. Her business partner, Carl Sebastian Greenwood, who was then living in a plush house on the island of Koh Samui in Thailand, was left to pick up the pieces. He's now serving 20 years in prison. His Koh Samui beach tan a distant memory. But where did she go? It was discovered not too long ago that she tried to sell a swanky apartment in London for $15 million. She tried to do this anonymously through agents, but her name popped up because of transparency laws. There is no doubt she still has many houses and apartments and a great deal of money. Those billions she stole are out there, and her investors are desperate for her to get caught. It's very possible she's had a face-changing cosmetic surgery, so she might look somewhat different. It's also likely that she's paying a personal security team a lot of money to keep her safe. It's believed that after going missing, she spent some time in Athens, Greece, and might have moved to the United Arab Emirates or even gone back to Germany. But the FBI says she might also be hiding out in Russia, some other part of Eastern Europe, or might even be back in her former home of Bulgaria. The agency will give you $100,000 for information that leads to her arrest, but we imagine some investors out there would like to give you much more than that. 
Still, there's a rumor that she will never be found, or at least in one piece. The rumor states that she was murdered aboard a yacht in 2018 on the orders of the Bulgarian drug lord Christoforu Samanatidis. One of his henchmen, who is currently locked up in the Netherlands on drug trafficking charges, is supposed to have killed her, chopped her up, and thrown the pieces into the Ionian Sea off of mainland Greece. The reason is Amandatidis is somehow part of her scam and she just had to go. Amandatidis is still at large, possibly in Dubai. Who knows, he might well be shacked up with Ignatova as they watch this video from their gilded palace and are laughing their heads off. Now for some more American grime. Omar Alexander Cardenas in 2019, a 46-year-old man was standing in the street close to a barber shop in Silmar, a small suburban neighborhood in the San Fernando Valley in California, when he was gunned down. The man was Jabali Dumas, described as a loving father who worked his butt off at the local trash company to make ends meet for his family. This is why Dumas' family and relatives were absolutely shocked when they discovered what had happened. A man walked toward Dumas and fired from about 30 feet away, fired off nine rounds from a semi-automatic handgun. One of the bullets hit Dumas in the head and almost severed his brain, which gave surgeons no chance at saving his life. This didn't happen in the dead of night when no one was around. There were quite a few witnesses. One of them described the assailant as a heavyset Hispanic male, light complexion, with noticeable prescription glasses, and wearing dark clothes. Police later watched CCTV footage and saw that Dumas, after finishing work, had walked into the 11,900 block of Foothill Boulevard, after which he went into the Hair Icon Barber Shop. Around this time, Cardenas had been seen walking in that direction. Later, the CCTV camera catches that same man almost jogging away, seemingly trying to tuck something into his jeans. Turns out that Dumas had left the barbershop then gone into a discount store. The cashier in the discount store later said she often saw Dumas, and later that day he seemed in a good mood, complimenting her and how attractive she looked. Moments later, he was standing against a pillar outside the store and was shot. The question is, why? Why such an awful act taking some kid's father away from him? We might never know. Maybe those two had a falling out in the past, or maybe Cardenas, who is known to have been a gang member, had an unsettled gang-related beef with Dumas. Cardenas, also known by his gang friends as Dollar, might have been sent to execute Dumas. Cardenas had connections to the Pierce Street gang, and possibly a gang called Pacoima Van Nice Boys Anybody Kill Us. While Dumas was working hard and said to be living a straight life, news reports suggest that in his younger days, he'd also been part of the gang life. Investigators said it was possible that the now hard-working family man had run in with a group that could have had a beef with the Pier Street gang. Whatever the case, the son is missing a father and Cardenas is on the run. There's every chance that someone watching the show has seen Cardenas at some point. The FBI said he might have fled to Mexico, where he could be working as a construction worker. Peter Chadwick, just captured. Let's now show how effective the FBI's most wanted list is. Hopefully it might serve as some inspiration. In 2012, a wealthy California businessman named Peter Chadwick strangled his wife to death. High school sweethearts and a parent of his three children, their relationship had turned very, very sour. Seems they'd been arguing about a possible divorce and the related financial issues. That day, their kids aged 8, 10, and 14 did not get picked up from school. Peter, born in the UK, had first blamed a handyman and said that same man had kidnapped him, but that didn't make any sense to the police. Mrs. Chadwick's body was found strangled in a dumpster and a lengthy investigation was started. Peter was a suspect but paid $1 million in bail to stay out of jail as the case took its course. In 2015, when it was looking like Chadwick was going down for the murder, he skipped a court date and left the country. He emptied some bank accounts of what investigators said added up to over a million. With so much money, he didn't seem to have much difficulty going on the run. He used a bunch of aliases and fake IDs and worked odd jobs down in Mexico. Seems over the years he must have run out of money and had to work like ordinary folks, although it's the thought that he might have done those odd jobs, including teaching Mexican kids English just to pass the time. In 2018, he went onto the FBI's most wanted list and people heard about the $100,000 reward money. Chadwick's face and name kept appearing on people's TVs and computer screens, and in 2020 someone said they'd seen him bussing tables at a tourist restaurant close to Puebla in East Central Mexico. Working with this information, Mexican and U.S. authorities arrested Chadwick and brought him back to justice in the U.S. after five years on the run. We don't know who gave the authorities that tip, but the press reported that they got it as a direct result of announcing that $100,000 was up for grabs. Investigators told the press, we received a tip with some general information that we could use to pinpoint Mr. Chadwick's exact location. With that in mind, you'd think that this next killer would have been caught by now. Badresh Kumar Chitanbhai Patel April 12, 2015 It's about 9.30 p.m. 
when a married couple, both working the night shift at the Dunkin' Donuts in Hanover, Maryland, walk out of the view of the CCTV camera at the back of the restaurant. Moments later, a man emerges alone, calmly switches off an oven, and walks out of view again. What's just happened is nothing short of brutal. As waiting customers wondered why no one was serving them, a crime of pure horror was taking place. The man, Badresh Kumar Chitanbhai Patel, was 24 at the time. His wife, Palak Badresh Kumar Patel, was 21. Both were Indian nationals living in the US, where relatives of Badresh Kumar Patel had helped them secure work and settle into the American way of life. But something was obviously very unsettled, because when they turned that corner, Badresh Kumar savagely beat Palak, bashing her with his fists and then driving a large kitchen knife into her numerous times. It was horrific even for the authorities, who later said she was killed in a horrible way. What would compel a husband to do something like that to his wife? They had their whole lives ahead of them. They seemed to get along just fine, too. A regular customer at the restaurant later said to the press, I'm shocked because they're very nice people. Behind that mask of young love, problems had been brewing. They both had visas to live and work in the US, but those visas were about to expire. They had to think about their next step in their lives, a step that was considerably different in both their minds. Madresh Kumar wanted to stay in the US and try becoming a fully-fledged American, while Palak wanted to return to her beloved India. On the evening of the crime, one of Palak's relatives had talked with her on the phone. She'd expressed that she was leaving the States and the decision was final. Hidden around the corner was Badresh Kumar, who was enraged at hearing that. It wasn't long after that he killed her. But where is he? There's no evidence that he somehow managed to get back to India. And that would be very difficult considering his passport was immediately flagged. We know that just after the murder, he walked to his apartment, grabbed some things, and got a cab to the airport in Newark, New Jersey. The cab driver later remarked that his passenger seemed friendly and calm. In New Jersey, Badresh Kumar booked into a hotel. After a night in the hotel, he went somewhere else. The FBI is not quite sure where, but it's suspected he might have had relatives helping him out. He was last seen on April 15th at Newark Penn Station. Where he went after that is unknown, but the FBI says there's a strong chance he's still in the US, likely with the assistance of relatives. His closest relatives are in New Jersey, Kentucky, Georgia, and Illinois, although he might have headed to Canada. An FBI spokesperson expressed confidence in his capture, saying, I am certain with the public's help, we will finally bring him back. Still, like all killers, he's considered armed and dangerous, so if you want to claim your 100000 bucks, it's best you talk about his whereabouts but refrain from getting too close to him. Someone watching the show has likely been in this man's vicinity at some point, so remember, call 1-800-CALL-FBI, and if you don't like using the phone, you can also write to tips.fbi.gov. This next man is also considered to be very, very dangerous, so again, do not approach him. Alexandro Castillo On November 26, 1998, the bundle of joy known as Alexandro Castillo came screaming into existence. What went wrong in the preceding years is anyone's guess, but we can say with confidence that this baby did not grow into a very nice young man. When Castillo was just 17, the age he was when he committed the crime that got him on this list, he was working at the Shomar's restaurant in Charlotte, North Carolina. One of his colleagues was 23-year-old Truquan Sandy Lai Li. The two dated for a short while, but the relationship was far from a happy one. They broke up, but Li didn't let Castillo forget that she had lent him some cash. On August 9, 2016, Castillo sent Lee a text message that stated he was ready to pay back the money. He told her he wanted to meet her. That night, Castillo was with his new girlfriend, 19-year-old Ahima Feister. Lee met with the pair that night at Quick Tip on Eastway Drive. What happened next is uncertain, but later Lee went to an ATM and withdrew $1,000. It's thought that she did this knowing a gun was pointing at her back. She went missing after that and was found about a week later dumped in some woods along Robinson Church Road in Cabarrus County. She'd been shot in the head execution style. Police immediately put the message out that they were looking for a male 5'6 and 185 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. They were also looking for Miss Feaster. Rather than begin her studies at the Central Piedmont Community College as she was supposed to, she ran away with Castile. A car belonging to her was later found nearby, while Lee's 2003 Toyota Corolla was later found in Phoenix, Arizona. We know exactly what happened next because the two were seen crossing the border into Mexico, their backpacks full of the necessities for a short life on the run. Castillo has maintained this life for many years now, but the FBI is pretty sure it won't last forever. They say there's a good chance he's still in Mexico, possibly in the cities of Agua Calientes or San Francisco de los Roma, but he might have returned to the US. If you've met him, he might now be going under an alias. Possibly Alejandro Rosales, Alejandro Castillo, Alejandro Rosales Castillo, or Alejandro Rosales Castillo. As for a feaster, she's handed herself in, in Texas in 2016. There's not much out there in terms of information about her, but news reports in 2017 said she was out on bond. 
Lee's family was not happy about that at all, according to the people close to the case. A news reporter asked one of the detectives, was she afraid of him? The detective replied, certainly. She would have been home if she could have gotten home a lot earlier. If only she'd gone to college that week, her life would have been so much easier. There's no news about the outcome of her trial, but we know she was indicted for possession of a stolen vehicle and accessory after the fact. If Castillo is ever caught, he will deservedly spend much of his life, if not the rest of his life, behind bars. Alright, last but not least, and arguably the most dangerous person in this show today, someone who's so sought after that if you can help get him arrested, the reward is a whopping 5 million bucks. Yeah, you heard that right. Yulan Arnai Archaga Carias you might be thinking, why on earth would the US government hand over $5 million to some regular person like me? The answer is MS-13, of which Carias, aka Porky, is said to be one of the leaders. At 5 feet 5, 160 pounds, Mr. Carias is hardly a guy you'd immediately be afraid of, but a lesson many of us learn the hard way in life is that size doesn't always matter. At 41 years old, this Honduran man scares the life out of his enemies and associates, and for a good reason. He's surrounded by an army of young killers, his devout disciples of death. He leads a gang whose doctrine is to be utterly, twistedly ruthless. They don't just kill their enemies, they make sickening, bloody statements that would impress a psychopathic medieval king. They torture people for fun, bringing a Games of Thrones-style mentality to modern-day Los Angeles, among many other cities. Numerous news reports state they've done that to many of the tens of thousands of people they've murdered. They're so cruel and so proud of it that they're often called sadists. An American attorney charged with prosecuting these people noted, their weapon of choice is a machete. We end up seeing people with injuries that I've never seen before, you know, limbs hacked off. And that's what the bodies look like that we're recovering. So they're brutal. As with child armies in some parts of Africa, MS-13 likes to recruit people when they're young and vulnerable to manipulation. They take the lost souls of society, kids without parents, the kids of abject poverty, who suffered terrible traumas, and thanks to the unwinnable war on drugs and the US's undiminishing demand, they're told that if they stick with the gang, they might as well be able to earn some decent money. It beats begging, or the $277 they can get on average per year breaking their backs in the snake-infested fields. A young member in America can make that in an hour if he's got his poop together. Since there's been so much poverty in many parts of Central America, including Honduras, there's been no shortage of boys and young men signing up for the gang and heading to the US with their first never-to-be-used-in-a-garden machete. They're not knighted with that thing, but if they were, Carius would be the king, saying to his new recruit something like, Arise, I do hereby dub thee Sir Killalot, and with this holy machete I maketh the heart extractor of our glorious valley of San Fernando. There might be 10,000 MS-13 gang members in the US, many in LA, but closer to 50,000 members all over the world, including in Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, Colombia, Korea, France, Australia, Peru, Egypt, Ecuador, and Cuba. Wherever they go, they wreak havoc, showing how extreme they are willing to be. Such a spread means getting a hold of some of the leaders won't be easy. Garius can hide out in pretty much anywhere he wants. It's also difficult getting people to speak, considering he can literally send out death squads to commit small massacres. Then again, is he really the number one? It's hard to say. MS-13 doesn't have a structure like the Italian Mafia. It's far too thuggish to have principles around conduct and honor where the word of the boss is final. It's also way too spread out to have one man or even a handful of men calling all the shots. Nonetheless, the FBI says Carias is a boss, the top guy in Honduras, and one of the main reasons why there's so many drugs and so much violence in the streets of the US. He is supposedly behind multi-ton shipments of cocaine that enter the US on a regular basis. The FBI will give you $100,000 for information leading to Carias's capture. The $5 million will come from the Department of State Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. If you don't mind risking getting your face flayed, your knees crushed, and your head decorating the top of a rusty spike, get in touch with the agencies today. But this massive prize is not targeted at people like you. It's been put out so someone on the inside will spill the beans on the boss. That's one reason why head honchos of organized crime tend to exhibit a certain kind of ruthless paranoia that Joseph Stalin was famous for. It's also a great way for an opposing gang to get rid of the competition while collecting some reward money as has been happening since the war on drugs was first conceived as a global policy. And as you know, in the world of organized crime, snitches get stitches. But in the cruel world of MS-13, it's more like this BBC News report says. Members of an El Salvadorian street gang stabbed a man 100 times, beheaded him, and cut out his heart in a park near Washington, D.C. We're not sure why it happened, but an expert on the gang said in another article, usually when there's been a murder it's because somebody has crossed them or has been an informant about their activities. 
The positive news is that from 2016 to 2020, something like 500 MS-13 members were convicted of crimes in the US. 37 of those convictions led to life sentences at an average cost of $134,400 per person per year. Just another 50,000 guys to go, so this should all be over pretty soon. Sticking with the underworld, watch this fascinating video. The coder who became a criminal mastermind, Paul LaRoe. Or have a look at this epic, how insanely creative prisoners escaped from maximum security prison.